Hey guys, welcome to Learn Today IGCSC. This video is a tutorial on physics, paper 4 theory, wherein 4 3 for October November 2023 examinations. Question 1, Part A. Oil of density 0.8 grams per centimeter cube is poured gently onto the surface of water of density 1 gram centimeter cube. The oil and water do not mix. Describe and explain the final position of the oil relative to the water. So the density of oil was 0.8 and it was put gently into the water. Since the density of the oil is lower than the density of the water, the oil will stay on the surface of the water. And the reason is because the oil has a much lower density compared to the water. Question B. An irregularly shaped solid object has a density of 2.7 grams per centimeter cube. Part 1. Describe a method to measure the volume of the irregularly shaped solid object. For an irregular object, we can place it into a measuring cylinder and measure the change of volume to get the volume of the object. Part 2. The volume of the object is 83 cm3. Calculate the mass of the object. We can use the formula density equals to mass over volume. So to get the mass, we need to multiply the volume by its density. The density of this object is 2.7 grams per centimeter cube. Make sure your units are all correct. So 83 times with 2.7 is 224.1 gram. And for your final answer, you need to make sure that you convert it into two significant figures. And that would be 220 grams. Question 2 Part A Figure 2.1 is a graph that shows how the extension of a spring varies with the load suspended from it. So this is the extension of the spring, which is plotted on the y-axis of the graph. And this here is the load, which is plotted on the x-axis of the graph. Part 1. Determine the spring constant of the spring. Under the chapter of 1.4 forces, you will learn about the Hooke's law. Hooke's law states that the extension of a spring is proportional to the applied force, meaning that as the load increases, the spring will extend further. And the formula of Hooke's law is force equals to spring constant times extension. You are asked to calculate spring constant which is the value of K. So the force applied here is 14 newtons and at 14 newtons, the spring extended 4 centimeters, which converted into meters is 0.04 and you will get a spring constant of 350 newtons per meter. Part 2. On figure 2.1, mark the limit of proportionality and label this point as L. Your graph should be linear like this. However, when an object has stretched to a point where it cannot return to its original shape, it has exited the limit of proportionality. And it will be this point over here when the graph no longer obeys the Hooke's law. So you can label this point as L. Question B. Figure 2.2 shows a car traveling at a constant speed around corner A on road. So this here is the corner and this car is traveling at a constant speed. Part 1. On figure 2.2, mark with an arrow the direction of the resultant force acting on the car as it travels around corner A. Let's first understand what is resultant force. When two or more forces are applied to an object, the object will only move in one direction. And this would be the direction of the resultant. So let's identify the forces that are acting on the car. The car is moving at a constant speed in this direction. And there is another force that acts on the car, which is the centripetal force acting towards the center of the circle. The centripetal force here is the friction. So the resultant force would be acting in this direction. Part 2. Corner B has a smaller radius than corner A. The car travels at the same speed around corner B as corner A. State how the resultant force changes due to the car traveling around a corner of a smaller radius. The resultant force depends on two factors. The speed of the object moving or the radius towards the center. The force can be increased by increasing the speed of the object or decreasing the radius. So with a smaller radius, the force increases. Question 3. Figure 3.1 shows a boy throwing a ball and an object in a fairground. The ball has a mass of 190 grams and travels horizontally with a constant speed of 6.9 meters per second. 
Part A, calculate the momentum of the ball. Momentum can be calculated by the equation of the mass times velocity. This will give us a momentum of 1.3 kilograms meter per second. Your answer should be in two significant figures and do not forget your units. Part B, after hitting the object, the ball bounces back along the same straight path. So at first the ball traveled this way and it says that after hitting it, it bounces back along the same straight path, which is like this, with a speed of 1.5 meters per second. So it moved in the opposite direction at a speed of 1.5. The object has a mass of 1.8 kilograms. Calculate the speed of the object after it is hit by the ball. When the ball hits the object, of course we know that the object has moved a little bit forward, and we are asked to calculate the speed of this object. When given questions about calculation, Always analyze your diagram by writing as many information as you can on your diagram, just like how I did for this question. Once we have analyzed this, we can tell that this question is regarding collision. And according to the conservation of momentum, the total momentum before collision is always equal to the total momentum after collision. So let's first calculate the total momentum before collision, which is the mass of the ball, Multiply by its velocity before the collision, which was 6.9 meters per second. So the total momentum after collision would be the object moving in this direction after the ball hits it. And don't forget to add up with the momentum of the ball bouncing back in the opposite direction. So let's first calculate the momentum of the ball moving in the opposite direction. The ball has the same mass of 0.19 and multiplied by its velocity. It states here that the velocity is 1.5 meters per second. However, it is traveling on the opposite direction. Initially, it was moving in this direction, meaning that this is a positive direction. If it is moving in the opposite direction, the velocity now will be in a negative value. So you have to multiply by negative 1.5. And now we add up with the momentum of the object. We are looking to find the velocity which is v, so we are going to leave that as our unknown. Now let's simplify this equation. Rearranging this formula, we would get 0.89 and the unit here is meters per second. Question C. The kinetic energy of the ball is 4.5 joules before the collision and 0.2 joules after the collision. Calculate the change in total kinetic energy of the ball an object during the collision. To find the change in the kinetic energy, we can first look for the kinetic energy before and minus it with the kinetic energy after. We are already given with the kinetic energy before, which is 4.5 joules. And we also have the kinetic energy after for the ball, which is 0.2 joules. But we do not know the kinetic energy for the object after the collision. So we have to look for that using the formula of kinetic energy, which is 1 over 2 times mass times velocity squared. The mass of the object is 1.8 and its velocity is 0.89 squared. So the kinetic energy of the object after collision is 0.71 joules. And the answer in two significant figures is 3.6 joules. Question 4 part A. The lowest possible temperature is 0 Kelvin. Part 1. State the name of this lowest possible temperature. The term we use for this is absolute zero. This is something that you should learn from your chapter 2 thermal physics. Part 2. Nitrogen boils at 77 Kelvin. Calculate the boiling point of nitrogen on the Celsius scale. The important thing that you should know is 0 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 273 Kelvins and 0 Kelvin is equivalent to negative 273 degrees Celsius. So now let's use this information to convert Kelvin into Celsius. So the value of Kelvin here is 76, take away 273, we will get a value of 196 degrees Celsius. Question B. The temperature of a fixed mass of gas at constant volume changes from 300 Kelvins to 400 Kelvins. State and explain, in terms of particles, the effect on the pressure of this gas. So at a constant volume, the temperature changes from 300 kelvins to 400 kelvins. So in terms of particle, we want to know how the pressure changed. When the temperature gets higher, it means that the particles right now has gained more kinetic energy. 
so the particles will now collide with the walls more frequently. When there are more frequent collisions of particles with the wall, there will be a larger force created. Pressure can be calculated by the formula force over area. So if there is a greater force produced, it means that the pressure will also increase. So for the statement, you can say that the pressure increases. Part C. A sample of gas is at a pressure of 120 kilopascals. The volume of the gas is doubled at a constant temperature. Calculate the new pressure of the gas. According to Boyle's law, the relationship between pressure and volume for a fixed mass of gas at a constant temperature can be written like this. So the pressure of the gas was 120 kilopascals. And let's say the original volume was x. And we are looking to find the new pressure when the volume of the gas has doubled, meaning that it is 2x. So the new pressure would be 120 kilopascals divided by 2, which is 60 kilopascals. Pressure is inversely proportional to its volume. If the volume increases, it means that now there are more space, the pressure will decrease. If the volume increased by 2, the pressure will decrease by 2. Hence here the pressure has decreased by 2 from 120 to 60 kilopascal. Question 5a. Figure 5.1 is a scale diagram of wave runs of red light approaching a gap in a barrier. On figure 5.1, draw three wave fronts after the wave has passed through the gap. When wave passes through a narrow gap, the wave will spread out. This effect is called diffraction. So make sure you have drawn three wave fronts and make sure that the wavelength of the wave fronts is equal to before it went through the barrier. Question B. Figure 5.2 shows the same barrier and gap. A wave of blue light approaches this barrier. On figure 5.2, draw three wave fronts of this wave before it reaches the barrier and draw three wave fronts after the wave passes through the gap. Okay, the difference from part A and part B is that previously they were using a red light and right now they are using a blue light. According to the color spectrum, red has the longest wavelength and violet has the shortest wavelength. Since we are using a blue light right now, that means it has a shorter wavelength compared to the previous example. So we're going to draw thinner wave fronts compared to the one before. And now we have to draw another three wave fronts after the wave passes through the gap. The only difference is that the size of the gap is larger than the size of the wavelength. So the wavelength after passing through the gap will diverge lesser than the one previously. So always pay attention to the gap size and the wavelength size.